hello everyone good afternoon good morning good evening we know so many of you are connecting from different parts of the world thank you linda one of our guests is not here today emmanuel yet he'll be joining us soon mimi and paul thank you for joining us for another climate talk by port protocol we are an international foundation building an open platform of climate solutions spread across the wine valley chain you see, we have this enormous ambition of acting as a catalyst for climate action within the wine world. Now, how do we plan to make this happen together? That is the shortest answer really, through collaborative sharing. Every day we are learning how to make this happen. To achieve it, to make it meaningful, we need our members spread across the wine value chain from different wine regions, different sizes, and different stages of climate action to share with this growing community what they are doing to address climate crisis. We are not looking for perfection, we are looking for action. Consider this an invitation to act and to join us. We would love to meet you and we are a click away. And these climate talks are one of our ways of achieving this mission of ours, having people from different regions, profiles, companies, share with our community their experiences, the best they have done and that they know. Now, today's topic starts with what is probably the most controversial word in the agricultural world, glyphosate. And given the topic, we could have chosen a more lively and heated discussion. We chose not to. And rather than focusing on the controversy around it that would probably lead us to nowhere except a lively conversation, we chose to focus on the solutions beyond it, as that is what our organization is about. As we focus on the facts, we know that countries such as France, Italy, Germany, Mexico have pledged to phase out on the use uh, of glyphosate at different paces. Others have banned it already. And regardless on whether you use it or not, climate change is always on the equation, whether it is through an approach that affects the life of soil, fauna and flora, or the choice of alternatives focused on the increased usage of fossil fuels. And so to explore solutions to a wine world beyond glyphosate, we have brought to our digital table, table sorry, Linda Johnson-Bell. Linda will be our host for today, and she's a wine writer, a consultant, a magazine editor and founder of the Oxford's Wine and Climate Change Institute. She's also a passionate woman and passionate for wine. We have Paulo Pereira, a biologist specialized in botany and a partner at NBI, Nature, Natural Business Intelligence. And in fact, just like the name of his company, he brings to the table today his experience using nature's intelligence and intelligence and ecosystems as bioindicators as well as alternatives to herbicides and pesticides. From Oregon, we bring you Mimi Castile. She's the owner and founder of Hopewell Winery in Oregon, as I just mentioned, a living model for a habitat-based regenerative model for agriculture. She, Mimi has told us that she's passionate about wine, but she's way more passionate about a regenerative approach to agriculture. She has done through a thorough investigation on this topic and Mimi's experiments are all with the goal of producing the most nutrition dense, healthy food and wine and maximizing the function and output of a diverse ecosystem. And soon to join us, we'll have also Emmanuel Bourguignon, he's the director of development at LAMS, Lab Laboratoire d'Analyse Microbiologique des Sols. He's a consultant in soil microbiology, ecology, and agronomy with a variety of crops. And his aim is to help companies and clients set up a sustainable agricultural practices which respect soils, their biodiversity, and the environments. And we, oh, my Manuel, uh, he's just joining us. Um, and without further ado, Linda, Mimi, Emmanuel, Paul, thank you for being here and the stage is yours and I'll disappear for now. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's topic, as Marta has pointed out, is indeed the most highly controversial issue facing today's world's, uh, world's food and drink security. And I specify security because the fact that increased food production does not automatically equate to food security is at the crux of this issue. And I'm going to be reading my notes a bit, so if I look down, that's why. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate, as Marta has pointed out, that this talk is not a debate, uh, but rather a solution-driven, forward-moving discussion. For the sooner we can find safer alternatives to the herbicides, the sooner we can eradicate herbicides from the marketplace. 
So first, a bit of a background. I, I will take one minute and put it into a slightly historical context and outline what the debate is about. So then we can just quickly move from there. The use of chemical-based herbicides in our modern agrochemical farming landscape finds its roots entwined in the murky past of the chemical factories of World War II and the Green Revolution that follows. The chemical warfare products and their infrastructures had to be repurposed, and they found new clients in the guise of farmers in the, in the agricultural sector. Um, branded as a new technical age that would revolutionize world farming, its original intentions have, in my personal view, been morphed into a situation in which multinational corporations have succeeded in adulterating nature, patenting nature, and then selling nature back to us. Um, and the herbicide glyphosate is that's one of the key ingredients in the weed killer uh, roundup, and it's at the center stage of the debate. So in a nutshell, the argument unfolds as thus. Those who support the use of the herbicides do so because it is effective uh, as a because it is effective because it is a systemic herbicide that moves from the treated foliage to other part plants, uh, including the roots. It is non-selective, so it can be used to control most weeds. It's the most cost-effective way to kill weeds and is less expensive than most other herbicides, is one of the least toxic and environmentally friendly herbicides in use, and that there is not enough glyphosate that ends up in a bottle of wine that could harm the consumer, and that replacing herbicides with mechanical weeding increases the use of mechanical equipment and thus fossil fuels. Now, the other side of the argument, those who are opposed to the use of glyphosate, argue that it is indeed effective, too, too effective in fact, that's the point. The vine roots share the same soil as the weeds and so absorb the herbicide into the plant as well as killing the microbiology of the soil. Um, also, it, the repeat sprays that are required and use as much mechanical intervention as mechanical weeding would. And the economic costs needed to transition away from spraying eventually are recouped and the savings to health and to the environment are reason alone to do so. Also, the product is considered carcinogenic and also affects the endocrine system. The makers ignore the fact that the herbicide is in every single item of the food chain and that consumers suffer an accumulative effect. And the entire idea of weeds and other ground cover being competitors for water and nutrients is false science and needs to be reversed and reconsidered and, and looked at. Biodiversity is considered essential and herbicides kill that. And lastly, the idea that ground cover or weeds compromise a vineyard's aesthetics. Um, is a southern appeal. You know, they want a lot of vineyard owners use herbicides just to get a nice clean look. And they don't understand that ground cover is just as beautiful. <laughs> um, personally, I support the scientific studies from the World Health Organization and others that have found glyphosate to be carcinogenic. And that's because I have firsthand knowledge of friends and co-workers in France who have been affected by this. Um, I also support the some 21 countries that have banned or restricted its use. I was pleased to read that Bayer, who's just bought Monsanto, have begun to phase out the use of glyphosate as a result of their having to pay over $8 billion in damages after over 125,000 cases were brought to court and are now researching, and they are now researching alternatives to glyphosate. So I think I can safely say that all of us here today think that the best way to solve this problem is to educate, to communicate, and to find better solutions for weed control and thus eradicate the need for this product on the marketplace. So what are the solutions? I've got to see everybody. Here we go. Screen. Okay. I can't see everybody. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, there you go, I can see you. Okay, good. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is we know that plants drink in the nutrients through the root systems from deep within the soil. And we understand the science behind the relationship between the quality and the taste of our crops and the health of our soils. So Emmanuel, starting with you, can you tell us what you consider a healthy soil? What makes a soil healthy? And then after Emmanuel answers, I want you both to pitch in and join in and there's no formal order, okay? Emmanuel. Thanks, hi Linda, hi everyone. Hi. Uh, thanks, uh, Marta and Christina, for inviting me on this uh, uh, very uh, interesting talk uh, webinar. Um, to answer to your question, uh, Linda, uh, I think if we want to first kind of define what, what, what the soil is in, 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 in the case of uh, vineyard, for example, I would say to be really 
journalistic and simple. It's kind of, I see it as a combination of uh, its mineral world and the organic world, you know, that makes it unique. It's a combination of those two. And it's something that we don't find anywhere else in the universe, actually. Um, on Earth, um, you know, we realistically, we had to wait for life to come out of the sea, you know, before we could, we could, before we could see the first soul, as we know it, appear on this planet, right? As long as life was still in the ocean, we had no soul on, on our planet. So I would put it as like soul equal life, you know, it's, you don't have life, uh, you don't have soul without that. And to what makes it healthy, um, it, it requires, you know, several parameters. It, it's not an easy, uh, it's not easy to, to summarize, but I would say among the key parameters to have a healthy soil, you have like the, the organic matter, the humus, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you need a, a humus that is rich in what we call acid fulvic and acid humic. The, these are molecules that are capable of fueling a high microbial uh, population and leaning into uh, microbial population. We need a good microbial diversity. You need a, a, a good um, bacterial uh, population, fungal population. The soil fauna uh, diversity, what I mean by that is you know, the earthworms that everybody knows about, but also the, the, the smaller arthropods. And to give you an idea, a, a healthy soil, if you add up all the biomass of, of those uh, organisms, you will, depending on where you are, but you, you'll be looking at six to 12 tons of, of living matter. You know, that, that's what would be, uh, I would see as a healthy soil. So 12 tons per hectare. So, you know, it's, it's uh, quite, quite important. And uh, look, the fungi alone, the mycelia of the fungi, you, you could be looking at like three tons per hectare of fungal mycelia within the soil. So that's, you know, it is imp an important part of the healthy soil. I would put a third point would be to, uh, the oxygen aerated porosity. It's, it's absolutely key that oxygen can flow freely um, within the soil. Um, if we had to look at a volume ratio in a soil, you'd be, you'd be looking at roughly 45% of uh, uh, minerals, uh, uh, minerals as in sand, silt, clay, 5% organic matter that will be for the solid part of the soil. And then you, you'll be left with about 25% of uh, 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 voids occupied by water and 25% of voids occupied by, by the air. And uh, water would be a fourth point that is really important. Like, water that is available for the plants and for all the uh, microbial life to carry out all the important biological reaction. So water is essential. Um, plant diversity, because you need, you need diverse root system within mm -hmm. the soil. Root systems that are capable of exploring different horizon in the soil for a soil to, to, to be healthy. And, um, and I will put like in, in other um, component things like as little as pollutant or inhibitors. You know, what, what I mean by that could be like pollutant, of course, like uh, uh, heavy metals, or mm. it could be also uh, things like monospecific systems where you have only one plant living on one system. It's hard for the soil to be healthy in this uh, condition. And uh, good nutrient availability for the plant. And just to clarify the question you've asked me, uh, I see it as in the, in the context of vineyards, or let's say agriculture, yeah. and points I've just uh, brought out there uh, as what makes a healthy soil uh, have to be taken within that context. If you are, for example, an agave or cranberry grower or rice grower, some of those parameters might not be as important. Yeah. And if you are walking through a mangrove or through a, a burrow forest, uh, again, what will make a healthy soil in those ecosystems will not be the same parameters as uh, what we're dealing here with uh, with viticulture or farming. So, yeah, that, that very good. The... <laughs> <laughs> now, who wants to add to that and even tell us a bit, perhaps, why herbicides can compromise soil health? Or does, does anybody want to discuss that or add to what they think about um, what they consider a healthy soil to be? I, I, Mimi, if you want. You go ahead, Paolo, if you okay. have something to say. Now, I, I just can add something. Uh, 
uh, I'm a, I'm a botanist, so, uh, uh, so soil is a, is a very important part of uh, uh, why plants are where they are. And, and I look at, uh, at agriculture as an ecosystem. So uh, for me, soil, the soil is part of this ecosystem. Uh, and, and it's very, what uh, Emmanuel was saying is very, very important. Each culture and each ecosystem is different. So um, uh, a vineyard in France, he was talking about 5% of organic matter. In Portugal, if we have 1%, wow, it's, it's great. And the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, usually the, um, uh, our, uh, the vineyard, it's a, it's a, uh, for me, it's a plant. So it's a, it's a, uh, I did the, 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 the Flora Guide of Portugal and we treat it as an autochthonous plant. So for me, it's not just a vineyard, it's, a, it's a one of our species. And that's very important because it's completely adapted to our ecosystems. What we did, it's uh, uh, to, uh, when we have a vineyard for uh, one hectare, now you have uh, uh, 20, 20, 1,000 or 2,000 of vineyards concentrated. So, so that's what what all is about agriculture. We, we concentrate what in what it's uh, benefit for for men. The the other thing that I I want to tell about uh, soil, uh, uh, I I don't consider um, there are um, bad plants. So the the all the all the name of, uh, I, I put it in front here, mauvaise air. So mm -hmm. all the mauvaise air, that, that's a, an anthropocentric view of, uh, of the world. There are no bad plants, weeds, there are no bad uh, um, virus or bacteria or, or fungus. There is a, an, an ecosystem that we can be in harmony or not. And uh, what, uh, going to the, the problem of the herbicides, what the herbicide is going to do, it's to re disrupt all this ecosystem. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, when, when I see, well, it is, is, is not very, it's not bad for our, uh, our uh, to not santé for our else. It's, it's not that important thing. It's, it, it's killing a lot of uh, uh, plants and a lot of organisms. So, when we have an ecosystem and a, a, a culture that we can benefit from this ecosystem, when we kill a part of it, uh, we are disrupting this this uh, this balance. And so we are, we, you have to fight ag against this this uh, the, the ecosystem and not work with the ecosystem. And this is not uh, only po poetry; it's it's about uh, also money. If we work with nature in the end of the day, we'll spend less less money than if we work against nature. Mimi, I pass you the word. <laughs> and I, I, in the interest of time, I'm, I feel very comfortable with both of your answers, and I'm sure that some of my thoughts will come out in, in other discussion. Okay. Well, then Mimi, can I get you to start off, perhaps? Your, what would you consider? Actually, it's two questions. I don't know if, if I should even bother asking the first one. You know, why do Hello? We lost you for a minute. We lost oh, I'm here. You, you okay. got me? Okay. Well, it's, 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 it's just, it's a very basic question, but actually, why, why do people want to get rid of, rid of weeds? As Paolo was saying, what is this attitude that weeds are the enemy and why do they want to get rid of the, the weeds? And when they want to get rid of the weeds, let's say that three times quickly, um, what are, what's, what's, what's your go-to weed killer uh, solution that is uh, natural? So twofold. Fair question. Um, and, and I also share the philosophy that we need to stop um, we need to stop labeling plants as being bad or good and see them um, more as indicators of what the soil environment is trying to tell us. And to me, you know, soil is really the substrate where all of life is kind of being driven and plants are the conduit that feeds that life, that drives that, you know, cycling of nutrients and that beautiful 
chronic disequilibrium that makes life possible on earth. So to me, you know, the idea that people have made observations over time um, going way, way back in our, you know, first cultivation of crops. It is true that if you if you eliminate everything else that's growing from a like a native virgin soil and you put one plant there, it is going to grow very robustly. It's going to have a very generous response to everything being cleared out from around it. But that's a temporary observation. And what we know is that soil doesn't want to be bare. And that's because it loses water, it loses carbon that way. All of the all of those nutrients that are supposed to be cycled in the soil require that life that is fed exclusively by plant life to be driven and continued to cycle. So that one time observation becomes entrenched in our institutional memory and becomes part of what we build our agriculture around. But it is um, actually just a temporary response to there being a lot of organic matter there for that plant to have all to itself. So in a, in a healthy agricultural ecosystem, plants need to share. They need to communicate with both the microorganisms and with each other. And we don't want to grow formula fed babies, right? We want to grow healthy, dynamic, nutrient dense food. And that is actually most, most achievable when we don't have any bare soil. So the idea of eliminating weeds to me is really almost exclusively aesthetic and are the plants that we like the least, the ones that tend to be very aggressive and very competitive, they respond the best and most positively to bare soil. So the more we perpetuate that bare soil environment, the more we're going to see the infiltration of what we call weeds into our systems. So when people ask me this question, I think it's mostly about changing our minds and changing, changing the way that we look at what plants are trying to tell us in the ecosystem. That was beautifully put that was <laughs> um do you want to start off with what your favorite weed killing solutions are if, if you in a perfect world what would you do so uh, I, mean, I, I just want to add something uh, that uh, you are talking about it and i i, I remember uh, when i go to the field with uh, with our clients uh, many times they tell me, well, there is a, we have a lot of problem with this plant for, is, for instance, one plant that it's completely adapted to soil that it's moved a, a lot of times, or even with the conies or the maranthus that are uh, glyphosate uh, uh, tolerant. So it's very interesting because what I tell them it's, or you stop to use herbicide or you stop move, moving the soil. And they are very, no, it's impossible. And I tell them, no, I, I'm, completely positive that it's like this because I, I saw it many times and I, I, I asked them to do the experience. So it's, it's really interesting to, to know that uh, many times what is a, a big problem to agriculture, it's, it's simply because they do all, as they ever uh, have, uh, um, have done it before. Always done. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I've definitely observed that and we, we don't like to change things. We don't like to step into what we don't know or understand. And I think that fear is a lot of what is keeping us, um, you know, sort of in an industrial model for agriculture because we've been, we've been taught that we need to depend on that model in order to feed ourselves. And it's actually just a matter of stepping into a different mind frame mm -hmm. and trusting trusting the environment to repair itself really. And, and there are certainly real life situations where a weed or something growing under the vine is going to compete, especially if you're transitioning. So I don't wanna discount people's observations in the field that you know, if you don't try to control the plants growing in the vineyard system, then you could see you know weakness in your plants over time. But I also think that 
some of what we need to do is allow ourselves to experiment a little bit more and not necessarily turn around 180 degrees if we start to see some signs of weakness because sometimes there's just a, a necessary transition period where our plants get more robust and they get more of what they need on their own time. So for me, to just to answer your question, Linda, I think there are a lot of alternatives to herbicides in general. My favorite and my most ideal world is when you can incorporate animals into the system that are herbivores, that really helps with nutrient cycling. It depends a lot on having the right type of system, you know, so having the trellis system that will support the introduction of animals, but even chickens, um, which could work in even very, very short headed systems can help with that cycling of nutrients and help build back the ecosystem health that we're looking for that will support plants and the herbs that want to grow around them. So that's my favorite, um, but there are a lot of other alternatives and I'm sure these gentlemen have a few that they, they'd want to talk about. Well, Emmanuel, you want to pitch in your favorite? Sure. sure. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, one of my favorite is, it, it can be controversial as well, it, it, it's soil tillage. It's be, because we're talking about vineyards and uh, soil tillage, when you go through the older literatures and you try to understand why men have gone into so much effort to do soil tillage within vineyards, because like, like Nimi said, it, it is, um, it's not complicated, um, I mean, you know, the idea of having herbivores in a vineyard should be something that is quite natural, considering that farming for a long time has been devised around having animals in the system. And we've, we've taken them out, even for other crops. But in the case of vineyards, what, what's interesting is that we also have, and, and maybe I'm more in the context of, of high of wines that have a, a typicity that try to reflect to have a sense of place, you know, reflect the, 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 the area they're coming from. And the, the soil tillage can have this double advantage. In, in one hand, you can manage the, the, the herbs that are growing within the vineyards and you can manage it in a way that you don't have to remove every single uh, plants. You can remove only what's underneath the, the, the vine, but you, could, you can also through this practice try to uh, manage the root system of the vine and, and especially try to, to get the vine to depend a little bit more on its deep root system rather than its superficial root system. And, and when you do the soil tillage, the on the vine soil tillage anyway, you, especially when the vine, when you start young, when the vine is young, you, you will really early on remove those superficial roots that the vine is naturally trying to, to put out in the soil because the top horizon is the most fertile horizon. So that's where the vine wants to have its roots if we let it, if we let it do what it wants. Um, but by, by doing this tillage, we can prevent that. And, and then at the same time, remove, we remove the, 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 the herbs that, that would be uh, too controversial, um, bring too much competition to the vine. And, and I will, like in the soil tillage, what's also interesting nowadays is that you can have different, you can implement different tools that can be adapted to uh, what type of management you want to have. You can have things like, like rotary star tiller, where you can go for, for speed. It's not necessarily super precise, but you can go through many hectares in, in a few hours and uh, you, you, will, you will remove the bulk of the weeds. Then you can go with things like that are more maybe intermediate, like, like the crow foot. A blade type of uh, you know it's something that that's it's a flat blade and it, it and it's done a, it does a surface weeding and then you can go for things like precision where you have more like a, a small plow and you work at very slow pace and this one helps you to, to go really close to the vine and and have a very clean on the vine um, system so it's I, I like the, the, the soil tillage nowadays with the evolution of, uh, of mechanics and technology, we, we're getting those really, really precise tools that can, that can make um, plant management uh, much more efficient uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the vineyards. Um, but okay. then again, 
like any tools, it has to be used with um, a, a little bit of reflection. And, and I, what I mean by that is from experience, what I'm seeing currently in some vineyards is that we've gone sometimes from one extreme to one another, so, which is in one case, we had 100% herbicides. And now people realize, oh, okay, herbicide is not good for the environment. I would go more with soil tillage. And we see excessive soil tillage. And mm -hmm. then so excessive soil tillage can be you know, really bad for the environment as well, because you deplete the carbon stock within the soil. You can uh, increase erosion problems if you have heavy slopes. So like, yeah, like, like any, any tools, you, you have to be really, really careful and you really have to um, oh. define, and I always try to do that on the vineyard, is to define the, the strength and the weakness of that, of that terroir of yours. And, and depending on that, you can then start to assess Okay, if if my topic is my, my, my subject is I want to, to to decrease herbicide use, then I need to go through this process of trying to have a good di diagnosis or evaluation of you know the weakness and the strength of my terroir. I, I have other you know uh, favorite thing, I mean good things like like mowing and winter crop and uh, but Paolo can mm -hmm. talk about uh, uh, cover crops. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, then, Paolo, give us a quick um, okay. answer on another method, and then I want to go. So we have to leave some time for that. I want to have a quick conversation about how long it takes to wean uh, um, from from herbicides. So go ahead, go ahead, Paolo. Shoot. Yeah. Uh, so I um, the um, by, basically it's it's um, uh, for me it's the important to to look at the, all the ecosystem. So. Uh, I'm talking about cover crops, uh, edges for uh, pollinators auxiliaries, also uh, an ecological design of vineyards. What I mean by that, it's uh, uh, run away from the traditional square and uh, to do something much more adapted to, to the soils and the terroir and the inclination and respecting the, also all the ecological structures. Uh, the forests, the, the rivers, uh, to less space for nature, because mm -hmm. uh, most problems about uh, about agriculture, it's because we, we disrupt this this balance with nature. So if you have something very very smooth, very adapted, it's much easier to to cope with um, with problems. And the first thing is that we we cannot apply a recipe for all the vineyard for 100 or 1000 hectares we should do it if we have to do or if you have to really to have apply herbicide or pesticide do it only where where is needed so it's uh, something like a small baby steps transition yeah. but doing a slow transition uh, a very a very uh, precision agriculture from the, the the point of view of of someone that has uh, a big problem of uh, with cicadella or uh, with the fungus or something like this. Um, the other thing is is the uh, what I do a lot. It's a, a precision ag agroecology. So it's uh, to, to find indicators in the in the species about uh, about the the soil the terroir, the problems if if it, if it needs uh, phosphorus or not, uh, and and to 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 really know what we are doing not just doing because we should do, everybody does like this. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, new, it's an, a knowledge agriculture. We know what the process, we know the ecosystem and we work with it. So it, I think it's, it's a slow process. Uh, uh, Mimi told me before and that it's, it's really important. If someone wants want to do the transition, we don't do uh, one vineyard out of 400 hectares from, from one, one day to the other. We have mm -hmm. to do it slowly knowing all the problems and how to deal with them one by one. That's, uh, I, I, lo I love how you said we had to put the vineyards back into nature, you know, where they were. You're quite right. We, we took them out, we squared them off, we made them separate. It's, what an obvious solution. Um, yeah, but back because to what... one of the problems, you, you have a lot of problems in vineyards because uh, when, when you put a vineyard in an old uh, stream, there you will, we will have, you'll have a lot of fungus because it shouldn't be there. It's not his ecology. It likes dry soil. So uh, if you do some uh, put water, it, it has really be done with a very parsimony, not uh, 
like it was a, a cornfield. It's not a cornfield. It's a, a Mediterranean vineyard. It's, I, I always say that because we, when we do agriculture, it's, like, it's not a plant. It's, it's our domestic plant. It's nothing to do with nature. And it's still, it's, uh, it's part of nature. Sorry, sorry, continue. No, 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 please, no, I can listen to you all day. <laughs> um, back to this, uh, the discussion of transitioning. Um, we know that um, some countries are, they have bans coming up so they're there, or they're already there. So we're talking two, three, four years. I know that each terroir, each ecosystem will have a different answer, but can you guys give me or give everyone an idea of what is a general framework? You know, is it, is it a matter of months or a matter of years? And then could one of you start off with telling us what the first step is? If, what, you know, what, what's the first step in transitioning? Uh, I, I can tell you right away, it's, it's Mimi told it already. It's, it's the mindset. It, it's, really, it's really that it's to want uh, to do it and, and to be willing to do it because it's, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, after there is the, of course, in, in Europe, uh, if you do the right things, you will, sooner or later you'll be compensated and uh, okay. agriculture know it. But beside that, it, uh, for, for me and uh, with our clients, we know when there is this uh, click, you know, it's, it's yes. something like okay. when, when I, 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 I show them uh, when a rare species like an orchid that it's in, in and, and uh, you, you see the light of his uh, eyes looking at it. Wow, I have this and I didn't know it. And it's, it's uh, yeah, that's it. amazing. Okay, but okay, let's okay, so back to Mimi. We we know yes, the mindset has to be the first thing that changes. But what, in a practical sense, is the first thing uh, you know a wine producer has to say to him or herself when they want to start this process? You know, is it a soil analysis? Is it you know what's the first step? How do they start? Yeah, I, I mean, think you know in in every situation, regardless of the the ecological system that you're in educating yourself about where your vineyard stands from a health perspective and yeah. where your soils are from a health perspective is is very critical. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So, you know, finding out a kind of baseline for your soils, your nutrient status, your water holding capacity based on how much organic carbon is there and, you know, the soil type. So getting some, you know, getting some real Our data knowledge um, about what you're dealing with and then being prepared to address certain nutrient challenges based on the fact that you're weaning away from an, an herbicide that basically you know kind of creates dead plants that can be very quickly metabolized by the bacteria and the fungi in the root zone. And that obviously has fed your plants for years and they've been sort of hooked up to a machine. So being prepared to be patient and observant and ready to sort of address some of those nutrient challenges and potentially, um, you know, some very resistant weeds that can be kind of aggressive, that just that level of knowledge gets past some of the fear. I think being armed with real data can help a person feel like they have an, a point of agency to work from. And then there are all kinds of, um, forums and community support now. I mean, I think that what we need to do as growers is create communities for ourselves where we can learn from each other and start building, start building communities around future agriculture that actually feeds people. So that to me is one of the real opportunities in transitioning vineyards. Found themselves with a, you know, the soil that was unhealthy and they can look at biochar or quite a few other options to try to build up those, those nutrient stores. And then at that point, perhaps choose a new method of, of, of weed control. Would that be a fair step? One, two, three. Yes. yes. Um, Emmanuel, what have you got to add to that? Yeah, from, like, from a very practical, practical point of view, one thing that I, when I, when I get to, you know, with people that, would, uh, that wants to, to, to try to, to do this transition, um, I always try to find with them what, what is their easiest vineyard to start with. You know, finding the one where they have already a smaller pressure of, of herbs or plants, you know, like companion plants within the vineyard. And, and so therefore they, they won't feel as uh, uh, the pressure is not as high. So 
for them it's it's easier to to start that way so i always target the vineyards that are already quite easy to manage um, mm -hmm. and also try to go with vineyards where we have either they are very close to the to the tool uh, shed or you know like close to the like, like say close to the uh, close to the heart to the heart and you know you, you you get to if it's right next to you then you have the time to quickly go in if you because like Mimi said like you know you, you don't have to be afraid of making mistakes or it's a transition so for sure you we don't know it all and each place is different so don't be afraid of that and um, maybe the, the the other thing I, and the other thing I also uh, discussed with them is uh, from a very practical hands-on thing is that to say to them also let's let's target a vineyard that maybe has already some um, yield issue. What I mean by that, I mean as like excessive yields issue. And you know, if you start to say, okay, we're going to try to remove the gly glyphosate or herbicide in in that vineyard, and we do get a slight reduction in yield because of competition of the plants or whatever, it's not such a drama because it's already a block we're struggling with in terms of, of yields and maturity yeah. and so on. So for me, these are very hands-on, uh, quick solution or quick things that we can uh, apply with. Uh, and, and then we also build up the confidence in the person because we, we give them reassurance that, okay, you, you know, on those areas, you're going to try and, and it should be okay. And then once they gain confidence, we do the transition to the more challenging blocks. That's an excellent. Um, uh, Linda, go ahead. Just, just one, one thing more. Um, <laughs> uh, it, uh, what is uh, the, the, what uh, Mimi was telling about the baseline? I think it's really, really, really important. I, I tell you uh, uh, many times, but it's it's uh, the most important thing. And what is uh, uh, interesting is when you go to a vineyard, uh, you can. Uh, you, you, for me, I was astonished. Uh, as a botanist, because I can find between uh, in in only one uh, one row of vineyards, I can find between fifty and uh, one hundred different species. If a vineyard it's uh, it's uh, really good, uh, ninety five percent of these species are autochthonous in Portugal. So you can see all already if the the seed bank it's good. If we, you have to do something in cover crops. And, and one uh, a reassuring thing is that when you have a, a, a seed bank there's, that guarantees you a cover crop till the, the, the moment that you uh, collect the grapes, it's really wonderful because you have all the auxiliaries that control the, the plagues. Uh, one exciting thing is that we start to, to design new vineyards. And uh, in these new vineyards, we put already the, the edges, we put the the water streams, plants, and and we also designed the cover crops because uh, it, mm. the history is very important. For instance, in Portugal, there was a, the, uh, a, 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 a something like 50, 50 years ago, there was a lot of uh, cereal fields, and there is till till now we, you have that uh, that finger that that DNA uh, DNA in the soil. You can see all the species. Uh, like papaver, uh, rafans, rafanistus, that come from 50, 60 years ago. So it's really um, the seed banks. It's really, really something very interesting and uh, exciting to work and to work in our favor. You can see, you can know which plants can can give you the predators of uh, cicadella, for instance. And it's it's really uh, experimenting, but experimenting with knowledge and with data. That's very oh, very good. So where do you all see the, the future in, in, in two respects? The first respect being in perhaps um, involving the consumer in educating themselves about, about the glyphosate. So we put them, do, do you see any international legislation requiring that information be put onto ingredient label? Um, and or how do you see an economic level playing field being created? Transitioning is can be expensive. Um, and I know, for example, France has started giving out tax credits, I think, for those who are going to cease using the herbicide. Um, to talk us through a bit how you think um, private and public sector grants or subsidies or consumer education might shape this 
life so fate free future for us. You want to do Emmanuel and Mimi, you want to start with that? Uh, Mimi, please go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I think it's critical at least uh, initially to ask ourselves, you know, what are we trying to achieve with a glyphosate ban? Are we just going to, you know, <laughs> turn our heads towards something worse, something more acutely toxic? And that's a non-starter for me. I think we need to, you know, we need to recognize that the future that we're trying to envision is one where <laughs> these things aren't in our food and our groundwater. So I would like to believe that we can steer the conversation towards ecological solutions for all. And yes, this, this will require huge amounts of support, I think, um, economically from our governments. I think that the time for subsidizing industrial agriculture has got to come to a close and we need to see a future where people are incentivized for actually contributing to the generations that will be needing these soils to be healthy in the future. So whether that's giving people subsidies for growing organic matter as opposed to losing it as though mm -hmm. it was our moral imperative, um, that that would be a great start. And there are numerous other ways that we could subsidize farmers that need to transition, I think, with both um, cooperative sharing of equipment and there are all kinds of models that we could use, but in the interest of time, that's that's where I would start. Let's start paying that's the people who are trying to do good work. <laughs> oh, absolutely, 100%. Go. <laughs> That's but, wonderful. All right, Emmanuel. Yeah, it's just, it was funny enough. Like yesterday, I was reading about this uh, this initiative in uh, in Provence in the Sandbourn uh, Natural Park, mm -hmm. where they are starting to pay uh, farmers and and vineyards owner for uh, increasing the plant biodiversity in their in in the in the blocks. So they, they wow. are, and they they even providing a like a consultant, someone that is uh, working for the national park that come and see them and, and help them or reassure them depending on the plants that are present. But uh, by doing this, they, they, they are actually really paying them. They're giving them a little extra money for, for keeping this plant biodiversity within the vineyard. So I think these kind of initiatives are, are definitely things that will help uh, and, and also empower people because then when you start on that article, like you could tell the, the vineyard, the, the, the vineyard manager was, you know, you could feel the, the, he was proud of, you know, being part of this, uh, the, the, this venture. So the, these are things that are really, really important. And, and also maybe uh, we, we need with the, with the politics and I agree with the subsidies and all that is very important, but we also need to get the, to adjust the timeline of this transition transition by uh, taking into account the, the, the different um, difficulties of the vineyards. On one hand, the, the economical value of the vineyard, I mean, by that, like in France, we have some of the highest valued vineyard in the world, you know, like in Champagne or Burgundy, where the, the price at which the bottles are sold um, could you know, you have less excuse to say, oh, well, you know, it, it is too expensive for me not to use uh, glyphosate and to go on to another option because, well, the, you're selling your wine at a good price. But if you are in a situation where either you're selling your wine at a good price, but the topography is really complicated, like you have super steep slopes, or you are in a vineyard where the, the, the baseline of the price of your wine is quite low, then your economic uh, challenges are not the same. And I think mm -hmm. those uh, subtleties should be taken into account in trying to come up with the, with the national or international strategy to, to try to, to reduce the, the, the use of this herbicide. Do, do natural uh, or do you know, healthier herbicides or you know, natural weed control methods, do they drastically decrease yield? I mean, is that the, the biggest? One of the biggest economic drawbacks, apart from equipment, etc. It's, it's, it's. I mean, it it really depends on the on the soil and the your your situation. It's. So it's, it's going to be different it's, for everybody. No okay. general answer. Uh, for okay. this, you have situation where clearly the the decrease in yield is negligible, and you have situations where it can be really important uh, decrease, uh, like a significant 
Uh, One of our listeners, she's just said it's it's an enormous difference for her and her her. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, I will not go into a, a general answer. This it's okay. a really a case by case situation. And she's transitioning. Yeah. She says. Okay. But in in uh, in uh, our experience in Portugal, when one of the vineyards, uh, there was no no decrease in production after the transition. So okay. it really depends on the on the eco general ecosystem. Just uh, okay. uh, to add to the what Emmanuel say, said now, um, I, um, there is really something very important always to look at the sustainability at the same level of viability of, of exploitations. We cannot stay. You have to do the transition even if you die, because if a good agriculture doesn't survive to the transition, it's, it's not good for anyone. And it's very important, the, the Euro policies, the national policies, and also the local associations. In Portugal, there is a PSVA that it uh, stands for Sustainable Plan for of Vineyards in Alentejo, and this the, uh, this plan it's already uh, um, increasing the price of the, the the exploitations that are more sustainability, okay. not uh, or completely organic, uh, or it's not obliged to be organic. Uh, it, it it has a lot of metrics, some of them related to biodiversity, and that's one one thing very important that the agriculture start to look not only to the productive area, but also the non-productive areas as important to sustainability yes. and to uh, uh, ecosystem services. So uh, soil, we talk a lot about soil, but in Portugal, very important, the water, um, yeah. the, the, the carbon, the carbon farming. So uh, to increase the organic matter uh, and all the, all, all the, the leftovers of vineyards, to stay in the vineyard, to, to put animals, everything it, it, in, in a, a very uh, long term, like 100 years, it will be always increasing the, the, the carbon. So it's, uh, it, we have to, to, to change the lexic. It's, it's not just doing soil, we are doing carbon change farming. Change the lexic. It's more fancy, it's more uh, payable for, by the policy, politicians. Yeah. And so, uh, but uh, I think it's very important to, 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 to to, to, to call the right thing. So to, to stop a killing culture and to have a, a nurture nature culture uh, with our agriculture. agriculture. So that's Absolutely. what uh, I believe. Well, so well said. Um, I think, Christina, do you have some questions from our listeners? I think there's a Q&A session. Because I can't see any of the questions, but, but I'd love to share them. No? No? Can she hear me? Linda, you have the Queen A in front of you. If there's a on the chat, on the chat, I am I'm, I'm in, in the, the chat. Yeah, yeah, but they're they're all from the corner. I can't see them. Right? There's some really. Oh, I see. Oh, and you see Q and A in the menu. Where do I start? Okay. In the okay, first here's menu. somebody. All right, here's a question. Um, Rob Simington would like to know the resources or the research. Uh, that proves that weeds and ground cover do not compete with the vines for water and minerals. I think maybe maybe Mimi answered that already. Kind of, we know they do. Mimi, do you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, I I I, I do want to just acknowledge that in in a lot of cases, yes, they are competing with your vines. And yeah. what we want to create is an environment where there's a cooperative competition. So we shouldn't view all competition as being bad, especially in cases where we know we have vigor issues. If you're out there in your vineyard several times a year, either hedging or tipping back your vines, then a little competition is a good thing and we shouldn't worry about that. If your vines look like they're starting to definitely lose vigor over time, your pruning weights are going down, that's a yep. feedback loop that you could be paying attention to and that's where you might want to employ something like a mechanical weed cultivation bar like what Emmanuel was talking about. But I think that that's what, you know, we as as farmers, we really need to go back to sort of the Renaissance model of, of farmer, where you are an expert in everything and an observer of all. And we should be, anybody who wants to make the transition can. I believe that so 
completely, but it will take more or less time depending on the innate strength of your system, how long you've used something and just recognizing that it's, you know, it's going to take some learning, then there's a learning curve. So yes, they, they do compete in certain environments for sure. And that's fine. <laughs> that's okay. There is a golden rule. If you don't see your vineyard, you should cut, uh, <laughs> cut a little bit uh, Hi, of the cover yeah. crop. If, if I can add something to, to this, which is quite important regarding that competition, for having tasted it, uh, making taste a uh, test in vineyards, where we done like rows or couple of rows where at planting, I'm, I'm talking here yeah. about a strategy that needs to be implemented at the planting of the vine. I'm not talking about a vine that is established and that has 20 years or 30 years of herbicide use. I'm talking about a vineyard that you are establishing. If within the first minimum two years, maximum three years, you do this root pruning on the young vines and then you have your your cover, your cover crops, the, the the plants growing in this vineyard, versus the same vine planted, but no root, um, but you don't cut the root system of the vine, the superficial root system of the vine when in its in its youth, you will find that the competition of the of the cover crops or the plants that are growing in your vineyard is a lot stronger than if in the early age of the vine you have force it not to rely on those superficial root system, but to rely on its tap root system. It's totally unnatural for the vine to do this. Let's be clear. That's why it's something that we need to do and we need to intervene to, to get that done, to change the way the vine will naturally behave. But by doing this, on top of increasing the typicity of the grapes you, you would produce, you will have this kind of double story or d double um, um, height for your root system. You'll have on the surface the root system of the of the plants, of the herbs that are growing in the mm -hmm. vineyards, and very dense root system that can protect from erosion and do the carbon sequestration and so on. And further deeper in the in the soil horizon, you will get the root system of the vines that will be uh, that won't be competing so much for for water because it will be much deeper than the the shallow root system. And and that's that's a technique. Even in, in dry, in, in fairly shallow dry soil, that is uh, quite efficient to combine the vines and having the, the plants without having uh, big competition issues. But need, that needs to be done early on. If you, if you, when you are in the transition and that hasn't been done in the early days of the vine yes. planting, then you can find competition problems a lot more, uh, they can be uh, stronger, yeah. Very good. Uh, one, one, one. Uh, I just, just to add one thing. In um, in one vineyard, vineyard that uh, we accompany in Douro, uh, the the best uh, the best vineyard for the best quality vineyard vineyard for for wine, it's yeah. located located near uh, a natural site that uh, in Douro they call Murtorius. That's uh, with a lot of plants, but not vineyards. And um, it, it's something that it's very interesting. For instance, the the wine in uh, in Australia, we know that it, it has something with eucalyptus and uh, uh, the terroir and the importance. The the roots, all the roots communicate and the, uh, do it changes. And it's something that we should really look at in the next years to see how. Uh, uh, nature around the vineyards affects directly by roots and indirectly by by air the the terroir and the and the quality of the of the grapes that go to the to the later to vinification and it's really interesting to uh, to 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 study that and uh, okay yeah. um now, there's a gentleman named Marcos and he's asked something that I've not heard of very often. He asks, what about infrared radiation fueled by propane to kill the weeds, you know, by dehydration? Does anybody use that method or have anything to say about that? I, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen examples effective? of it. Yeah, it, it is effective. Um, there is, um, depending on the, on the 
weed. I mean, also, also like like Paolo said, it's it's a word we should ban. For, or Mimi said <laughs> that too. But, you know, it, to, for for plant management, um, so so depend on the species. But you have species that have a, a good uh, root system where they have reserve and they can they can grow back after this treatment. So it is, uh, and and from a climate change and carbon emission it's 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 a technique that maybe is, is still you know using a, a quite a lot of energy so it's uh, i've seen also example uh, i've seen that in switzerland where uh, they've implemented um, uh, a weeding system with um, high pressure water hot high pressure water and i've seen it you know working uh, i was walking behind the machine and and for sure it works but then again um, we can I mean, in the long run, you know, the, the energy uh, that is being used for, for this system is, is quite heavy, but um, yeah, they are. Okay, that's, 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 anybody else want to add to that? No, I think those, are, I've got the, the, most of the questions sorted. So unless anybody wants to add anything. Okay. So, I'd, I'd like to add something for the, you know, cause we, we've talked, I, uh, it's regarding the, the vineyards. Um, let's not forget we we also Paolo mentioned you know it's part of nature and it's an ecosystem and so on, which I agree uh, to a certain degree. We we are dealing with something regarding if we are organic, uh, biodynamic, or conventional doesn't matter. Uh, in, in any scenario, we we are dealing with something that is totally art artificial. Uh, we are creating an ecosystem for the vine that is not its natural ecosystem. Its natural ecosystem is the is the forest. And it's a vine and it grows on trees. So um, it's yeah, it, it's unnatural what we're doing. And uh, re if we do it regarding we are organic or biodynamic or, or, or conventional, we it, because we're doing something that's unnatural and it's not self-sustained. If 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 mankind stop. Uh, looking after those vines, it, it, it goes to, you know, it's not a vineyard anymore anyway. Mm -hmm. um, we, any of those techniques can generate mistakes that uh, can can be costly for the environment for, the, the thing with organic and biodynamic maybe is that those um, those mistakes are, um, we can uh, we can backtrack uh, is more easily and uh, I think they are more forgiving for, for the environment than uh, when when we're dealing with chemicals on, on a time scale on a human time scale anyway of course on on you know if you're looking over millions of years it's another another question but on a on a decades or, or century time scale I think the with the organic and the biodynamic the mistakes that we might make are, are not as uh, bad as uh, what we do with conventional so it's, that makes uh, sense yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got two more questions that um, our listeners have brought in. Uh, one is, um, can someone tell us, again, I'm sure it's going to be a different answer for everybody, but what are the biggest costs in transitioning? What, what are the costs? Um, what are the categories of costs? I mean, again, the itemization might be different for each person, but what is so expensive about transitioning? What makes it um, costly? Who wants to start with that? I, from what I, uh, in Portugal, one cost very important it's machinery. Okay. You have to have machinery to to do all the managing uh, without <laughs> herbicides and pesticides. So it's it's a, a lot of adaptation depending on the if it's in the north or in the south. Okay. Yeah. So if, I, I, is that so? Is that because the machinery is really exp expensive? So they don't they. I don't understand. They they're they've invested so much in the machinery to do the the spraying that it's it's a loss of that no. infrastructure. It has to be yeah. completely adapted to the to the vineyard to to the scope between uh, uh, rows of vineyards. So it's it's uh, it, it, it's it, and it's much more intensive than uh, if they use uh, herbicides. The 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 work in the vineyards it's more more uh, intensive. Okay. Now, um, does anybody want to add to that? I have another question, but I'd like to 
if anybody wants to add about the costs of transitioning. I think there are systems where you can almost make the transition without incurring more costs. If you're just transitioning away from sure. herbicides, because a lot of systems will be able to transition and have permanent cover without that needing to be addressed. If you just can accept that you're going to have weeds in your vineyard or yeah. forbs that you don't like the looks of. But I think what Paolo was speaking to was if you yeah. if you still need to address weeds that that equipment that additional equipment can be very costly it can you know easily be tens and tens of thousands of dollars to get like say the undervine weed cultivators and things like that okay um and here's a quick question you may know this um since you're closer to California um Pam Strayer has written and asked um what the current atmosphere or thinking is on chemicals that are coming out. Um, she said she's concerned that there are people switching to worse chemicals and you kind of alluded to that. Uh, so they can say that they're not using glyphosate. Is, is, could, do you know anything about that situation? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the American marketing system at work all over the place. It, it's really, you know, we've made it about one, <laughs> one very important chemistry, but just swapping in others is um, the, the way of getting around talking about the elephant in the room, which is glyphosate right now in, in America. And that's, I mean, it, it's atrocious, but it is what some people are looking at. If we have to get rid of glyphosate because it's become this marketing nightmare, then what are we gonna, you know, what tool are we gonna insert? And a lot of those people are turning to pre-emergent acutely toxic um, chemistries. And I think we need to just aggressively lead in a different direction. I, I mean, there there is no solution to people who just want to have a marketing story. I think hopefully other, other things will deal with that. But um, yes, that is definitely happening. I think it's happening in a lot of places, but we, we always want to put things in such a myopic, <laughs> view it's, it's what's that game guacamole we just hit one yeah. and another one will pop up yeah so, <laughs> so and any more questions lots of questions um uh do you know of uh now who's asked this do you know of any natural or organic molecules that have good effectiveness controlling weeds uh, there's the there's the pelargonic acid that's been quite used uh, you know it's is uh, one of those new molecules that have been uh, put up on the market. It's it's uh, coming from uh, from uh, plants like uh, geranium, and it's uh, but it's a defoliating uh, chemical. I mean, it's a defoliating acid. It, it won't kill the plant, so you will have to probably use it uh, at a, a minimum of twice a year, and and it's best effective on on small seedlings. Uh, it in France, anyway, this uh, pelargonic acid doesn't have, um, uh, hasn't been uh, accredited for for organic uh, farming. They they're trying to 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 get it past the, the to get the accreditation. Uh, I don't know if we, if it will happen or not. But uh, currently, I'm as I'm not aware of commercial uh, herbicides that that can work. Uh, on such a wide spectrum and as uh, efficiently as glyphosate can. Um, to, what I see is, is more like the yeah, defoliating systems, uh, defoliating uh, molecules is uh, an option. Um, I, I think it, 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 might, it will be useful for a transition, but like Mimi or Paolo have said before regarding plant communities and so on, uh, the idea is to it's only for the transition, you know. The, the I think the end point is is to get this uh, nice uh, um, biodiverse plant community within the vineyard, where the aggressive colonizing plants, the, the the one Mimi talked about earlier on, are not so aggressive because they don't have the space to be aggressive anymore because they are being com in competition with a lot of other plants that are growing uh, in the vineyard. Very good. And um, what about mulching? I think uh, Monica has asked. Uh, we've discussed soil tillage. We've discussed the um, you know, animals. We've discussed a few other solutions. 
How about, how does mulching fit into the solutions dialogue? Paolo, you wanna talk about, do, yeah. do, you, do your clients resort to, yeah. do they use some mulching? Yeah, uh, sometimes yes, and and and, and we are now now trying also to to use uh, uh, for, uh, um, the forests around the 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 vineyards to to get some uh, wood to do the mulching. So it, it, yeah, it's 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 a very interesting uh, way of uh, doing a circular economy where where you can get everything from the the same place. Uh, one one important thing uh, just uh, about cover crops is that it's really important to have a lot of different species. We are not talking about uh, uh, or, uh, just the organic matter or uh, nitrogen fix fixation. We are talking of, about protecting the soil. So to have at least uh, four or five different families, it's really important, even for uh, the, the, the people that sell the, the seeds. To start to sell something more than uh, only uh, gramina and the leguminosa, it's it's a, but it's a, a way uh, and and um, yeah, but um, the to look at uh, all the, the the property as a as a whole and getting the uh, and that can can also be important for for the terroir the, to get uh, some oak leaves to the to the the middle of the vineyard or. Uh, one thing about the, the natural, in Portugal, there are some groups working uh, with the uh, terpenos, with the uh, molecules from uh, aromatic plants that are very good for uh, as uh, fungicides and virucides. So uh, I don't know where it, it's going, but there are people working on, on this, uh, these matters, that's for sure. All right, it, 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 anybody wanna to add to that? No. Oh. Pretty spot on. Okay, another question. Um, uh, so somebody's written, what do you think of Mexico's decision to ban glyphosate entirely? I guess, I think we probably think that's good. <laughs> <It's> good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it is that good that that is, another, that, that is another place where a lot of other chemistries are in a lot of use. And, um, you know, just banning one uh, often creates a vacuum where <laughs> all the other ones are in. <laughs> so um, I think it's interesting. I think it's brave. And I hope that it doesn't go in that direction. Um, and, and a very la last quick, quick, quick question. Do you think what's the best way we can educate consumers? You know, they're, they're so careful about how they, they won't buy an, or, uh, they want an organic chicken, they check what the chicken's eaten, They'll, they want organic vegetables, et cetera, but they, they don't ever look into what they're drinking. Um, and in their defense, there's very rarely enough information. I mean, you have to know a vineyard, you have to know a producer, you have to know a region to, you know, I, I would like bottles to say, you know, whether or not they've been irrigated or not. Um, so how, how do we help consumers the right questions and feed them the right answers. That's a, I guess it's a big one though, isn't it? In, in Portugal, there is uh, this uh, PSVA that uh, it's putting already a system of certification of okay. su sustainability timber in, in, the, in, the, in the producer and also in the wine uh, brands. So it's, it's a, a way to, to get there. I think it's very important to to certificate, to have uh, some some kind of label, uh, not about just the organic, uh, because that's one label, but about all the ecosystem service. And th I think this is the way Europe is going to, if if it yeah. Is, yeah. does the the right uh, is 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 homework. If politicians do the right homework, uh -huh. yeah, that's the. But it's, it's very confusing though, because as you. As you you're supposed to know what's in an organic wine or what's a biodynamic wine or what's a natural wine. There's so many different certifications and, and categories of these wines. It, it's, 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 it must be a minefield for consumers. I, I have something to say about that, um, which will probably light some people's hair on fire. But I think um, for me, at least, this is part of a larger conversation about how we move back towards more circular economies and where you actually know where your food is coming from so that you Local. can ask questions from your farmer. I, I think that's really, you know, our supply chains are so, yeah. so tied to a global economy that has no place uh, calling itself sustainable. So 
to me, that's really where, you know, certification is what we have now. It's not enough. You need to be able to ask the question. You need to see, you need to drive past the farms that you eat from or walk past them. That'd be even better. That I mean, I think that that's, that's how we really start breaking this down. Well, Mima, you've brought us full circle. That's it. You know, eat local, drink local. Then you don't have to ask any questions, do you? Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, well said. Good. Um, I, I think are we are we finished? Anybody else? Yeah. Good. I hear Marta. Yes. <laughs> There's tons of questions. <laughs> I know, but you know who's going to have to answer them. Uh, you are. <laughs> no, not me, not me, but we've taken the questions out and we'll continue to do that. We'll send them to our panelists. We mm -hmm. thought it was enough. We could call it a day. We could go on. Questions come, keep on coming. They're very good questions, too. They're yes, fabulous they are. Questions. That's why yeah. we are definitely going to give them trouble. And I do want to just point out one of the questions because it's really important to us. Picking up two points because... Uh, Mimi mentioned the, the need of a community to, to be a forum of, of learning, and that's what we are at Porto Protocol. Uh, Paulo gave an excellent exam, example coming from Portugal, one that is an inspiration for us as well, which is the sustainability program of the Alentejo region in Portugal. But we are a community, and picking up on one of the questions from Will Drayton in the US, he says, where are these case studies? Where can we see them in the website of Porto Protocol? So we'll have to chase these guests of ours here uh, in order to, to have them share in a written format their uh, experiences. But nevertheless, that's what we are here for. So if any of you guys out there have any doubts or anything that you'd like to know in further detail, do tell us and we'll chase these members of ours or any others, and that's what we're here for. I am not going to summarize everything we heard because, and but I do want to thank you very much because I think what we managed to do here today was really amazing because we managed to, and I do hope you agree with me, we managed to, to approach the most controversial topic in the most constructive fashion. And I do hope you agree with me on that. And I'm so grateful as an organization uh, from uh, on behalf of Port Protocol. I know you are all passionate about this topic and I know you are all passionate about ecosystems. And I know it was an, a challenge for you too. And it was a challenge for us. We knew how challenging it could be to bring this topic to the table and how could this go wrong? I mean, I hope we're not, I think this went really well and I hope you, everyone out there really learn from you guys. I am going to send you the questions because there are so many and that's all for tonight. We'll see you in a month's time on, a and this is really important as well, sorry. On April 15th, we'll be having a climate talk on climate in a bottle. And we'll be only focusing again, that's actually how our climate talk started a, a year ago in May last year, actually just talking about, again, the elephant in the room, which is packaging, but we'll just focus on the bottle this time. We'll have great guests as usual for you. So we'll see you then. I do hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. Thank you. You'll hang up, but we'll contact you again in a minute soon because we'll have to wrap up this one. All right. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.